Hey there, Victoria here. I'm so glad you're tuning in to another episode of the Choose to Think podcast. I've had you on my mind quite a bit lately. Sometimes when we put the feet on our faith and when we choose to think, things get a bit messy at first. As I was studying Psalm 51, I couldn't imagine a better psalm to highlight before Easter or Resurrection Sunday, as some prefer to call it. In so many words, the message of Psalm 51 is an Easter message. It not only invites us into a restored relationship with the God of the universe, but this poem also beckons us to enjoy and practice freedom in our lives every day. With the COVID-19 pandemic crushing down on our nation, we all need to be reminded of the hope we're offered as a result of the divine miracle of Jesus' resurrection. This hope allows us to walk victoriously in this life, even against all odds, even against our mistakes and our blunders, and in every situation and trial that we face. I want to dedicate this episode directly to the believer who's received God's saving grace but who still struggles with the baggage and weight of shame. Perhaps you'd call yourself a prodigal, where you went off track, God helped you back, but the disgrace and dishonor of your actions still haunt you. Maybe even now you are trapped in the mire of addiction, and the boatload of shame has created a toxic cycle of goof-ups. Hearing that word shame may conjure up an avalanche of memories, lies you've believed or perhaps still believe. Maybe you hear the enemy knocking at the door of your mind and heart accusing you for your missteps, or maybe you're your own worst enemy, saying things to your soul that do not come from God. He would never say them. Maybe the world, especially other Christians, remind you of your failures. Ouch. Well, this is the voice of shame, and we're going to face off with shame, all right. Are you ready? In this episode, I'm going to tell you of a story about my friend Sally. A while back, she and I met to catch up at an outdoor cafe in Lexington, and as we were sipping on iced tea, she shared with me this huge skeleton in her closet that put a lump in my throat the size of Jumbo the Elephant. Do you remember him? Man. I watched the tears just roll down her face. Her eyes were racked with such pain and turmoil, and in her voice I heard the hatred that she was feeling for herself. It broke my heart. Sally's story was that of the prodigal child. She had already come back to the fold after her fall. She was a believer and lived her life seeking God and His ways as best she could, but this dark secret that she shared with me had never before seen the light of day. We sat in silence for a moment, and then she asked me what, she said, what what would you do, Victoria? And she said, how can can I get rid of this shame? I took a deep breath. The air felt a bit still, and my heart was racing because I could so relate to what she was asking me in so many ways and what she had told me, because I also knew what was in store for her. Joy, freedom, peace, and a new direction. So listener, let me share with you what I shared with my dear friend, Sally. Please stay tuned. But first, have you subscribed to this podcast? I would really appreciate it if you would share your favorite episode with a friend. Just tag them on social media. That would be awesome. Please help me get the word out in my quest to help others find freedom in this life in practical ways. Also, did you know that soon I will launch an online course called Choose to Think When Your Soul is Hungry? This course course teaches you a method to overcome bad habits that lead to comfort eating, anxiety eating, and any number of food issues. I'm sure you've seen all those memes on Facebook lately about weight gain while we're tucked away at home. Seven women are currently taking the course with me in beta format. And you can see what they're saying as well as get more info on my website, www.startwithagratefulheart.weebly.com. If this is something you might be interested in, please let me know so I can keep you updated in the course launch. The class would be great for small group or to complete with a friend. You know, you can say goodbye to yo-yo dieting and mindless eating once and for all. Okay, back to Sally. I pulled my chair a bit closer, and these are the things I said to my sweet friend. 
I've struggled with shame too, Sally, because of my actions, both before and after I knew Christ. You're not alone. Let me tell you about the cargo that I've carried in the shame department. You know, it felt like a two-ton freight liner on my back. I felt like a second-class Christian, as if there were such a thing. I truly know how you must feel. And then, about four years ago, by God's grace, I discovered this method or a process of letting go of all the toxic junk riding around in my mind. And it helped me in far more ways than just with dealing with shame. What's really cool is that neuroscience actually supports this biblical principle. Really, it's a process that puts into play what God says we should do with our thoughts and our emotions. The the preliminary work you've already done. Uh, You've admitted and confessed your sin according to God's standards, and you see clearly that what you did was wrong. You've also asked God to forgive you, and He has. The good thing is that you already know that your sin is canceled. It's washed away, and you stand completely and perfectly pure before your Heavenly Father. You've been made righteous by God's atoning work on the cross through Christ. And now you're wanting to find a way to live out the forgiveness and restoration that you've received. So here you are, and that nagging voice of shame keeps cropping up in your mind. I was there too, Sally. So it's time to armor up and fight back. Picture yourself as a fully but modestly clad, incredibly ferocious female warrior. Is that okay to do? And, you know, she and I laughed a little bit over that image. Um, And I said to her, I think you're at the point in your journey where you really do want freedom. I can see that you no longer want to carry this load and that you will be committed to the process of disengaging with so many lies that you've been believing. We will pray that you find the motivation and strength to keep the momentum going every single day. God will help you. You're actually in a really good place for change. I tried to encourage her because she was. And then I said, let me tell you about the method I learned four years ago and one that I still use to walk in complete freedom in my life. I'm kind of on maintenance mode now, thank God. You know, the process that I began to put into place is the biblical principle that we are charged to take thoughts captive. And that's from 2 Corinthians 10. And we should operate daily from a renewed mind. That's in Romans 12. These are gifts for us. These are mandates or gifts that we've been given that we can put into practice practically in our lives. Well, I really didn't know how to do this. I mean, hey, it sounded good, but what did it really mean? It was about that time that I went through the biblically-based 21-day detox program from Dr. Caroline Leaf, a professing Christian and neuroscientist, and that was just my starting point. Through daily effort, journaling, and much prayer, I learned how to methodically take every thought captive. From there, I isolated the feelings and the emotions those thoughts were actually producing or provoking in me. I did a bit of reverse engineering to get to the toxic roots. God was with me every step of the way. And this is exactly what I would encourage you to do, Sally. Really, you're halfway there. Sally, your heart is broken over your sin, but your eyes are on yourself. Guilt is a necessary helpful emotion that says your behavior was bad, which causes you to desire the forgiveness. But shame, on the other hand, is telling you that you are bad. And this is where I think we should start. Say, do you mind if I grab my notebook and we can walk through some of what you told me that are your thoughts regarding this issue? Okay, I heard you say these things. I cannot believe I ever did that. What I did was horrible, and so am I. I hurt so many people. I ruined everything. If anybody knew what I did, I just couldn't go on. And I call myself a Christian. I'm the worst kind ever. Well, Sally and I took those toxic thoughts captive by writing them down, literally. Then we went through each one, and instead of agreeing with each lie, we attacked it with what I call a truth lead. That living and active word of God, the sword of the spirit, that is a scripture verse. It could be a passage that leads our thoughts in a healthy and vibrant new direction. My friend Sally had all the head knowledge, let me tell you. She could quote so many scripture passages and she just wasn't applying them. She felt beyond their reach and impact. This is a phenomenon that I've seen in many Christian circles. We don't know how to apply the truth to our lives in practical ways. Just to oversimplify things here, here's one example of what Sally and I did that day for her for that very thought that she that she was thinking, what I did was horrible and so am I. 
We both agreed that the action was horrible, but this did not make Sally horrible. Christians are not perfect. We goof. We get off track. We are swept away by lusts of our flesh and worldly desires. We're feeble creatures made of clay, yet we have God within us to help us in our weakness. We have the power within us to say no to sin. So I encouraged Sally to replace that toxic, shame-filled thought that invited her to believe she was horrible with a truth lead that emphasized just how much God loves her. And do you know what? This is the scripture verse that she chose. It was from Romans 8, 3, 8, 38, and 39. It says this, For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Sally pictured herself led by the Spirit, walking step by step in joy, not looking back, but looking and walking forward from this point, absolutely blanketed by God's love. You know, I saw a wave of relief come across her face, but we don't want to stop there. Just because we believe God loves us doesn't mean we will necessarily walk consistently in the freedom this love offers us. This is where she was getting snagged. We are charged with taking every thought captive, and Sally was determined and committed to this action item. It's hard work and requires soul searching and time, but God was with her every step of the way. Now, before we go further, let's take a break from our sponsors. And welcome back. You know, a day arrived when Sally beat out those toxic thoughts one by one. But they sort of kept cropping up, so she was ready to do some root excavating, that mighty and wonderful work that produces healing by the Holy Spirit. You know, she was feeling frustrated with the take every thought captive approach, and she knew it didn't end there. This was what I suggested that she get to the root of the matter. To oversimplify this process, I suggested that her big root was fear. And I encouraged Sally to isolate why she felt that she was horrible and to see if she could find a connection with fear. A few days later, she phoned me and she said this, I know I'm afraid I'm not worthy or lovable because I've made such horrible choices. I felt obligated to feel ashamed because I heard my mom tell me often as a kid that I should be ashamed of myself for my behavior. There was a direct connection there. I learned to hold on to shame because I thought I had to. I was afraid to let go because I didn't know what else to cling to. You know, it's a scary place to feel vulnerable, human, but extremely sorry and repentant all at the same time. Somehow, she said, I channeled all these emotions into shame, which became a part of my identity, something I was supposed to be, that bad person I was because of what I did. I was afraid to let that part of my identity go. I was afraid that others didn't, that others didn't think I had a right to live victoriously because of my actions. Okay, what she told me just blew me away. You know, it took Sally months to to disintegrate all the toxic thoughts, the emotions and roots related to her sinful choice. But God, but with God's help, she did it. There was no skeleton in her closet anymore, and the joy and twinkle in her eyes proved it. On another day over coffee, she pulled out a worn leather diary of sorts and read to me some of her truth leads that she used and she continues to use to pivot her thoughts. And this is what she read. She said, God, your love paved the way for me. You died for sinners just like me. You died for prodigals just like me. You turned my ashes into beauty. I'm rooted in your love. I don't play on the enemy's team anymore. I don't focus on my sin, my transgression, my iniquities, or my missteps. My eyes are on you, Jesus. You've washed, cleansed, cleansed and purified my heart. You've restored the joy of my salvation. This is my story and this is my song. I'm sticking with it. I will praise you and stand forever grateful for the forgiveness that only a righteous God can bestow. Your love and justice collided on that tree and I'm forever grateful. My eyes are forward focused only on you. I will not be shaken. 
Wow, these thoughts, can you hear them? They're all rooted in love. This is the divine mystery and is what Jesus' death and resurrection offers to us. He proved his love on Resurrection Sunday, all right, and we are invited to live out his love every single day. Sally meditated on her truth leads daily. She rewired her brain literally. I'm talking about in a neurochemical, physical sense. She used the truth leads when she had the toxic memory or when something out of the blue reminded her of what she had done and what she did. She read her truth leads aloud, posted them up in her house, in her car, at work to read daily over and over again. She rebuked the enemy of her soul often. And Sally, like you and I, are in a war on this earth against our own flesh, the world, and the enemy of our soul. The battlefield is in our minds. This is serious stuff. Sally desired to have a Genesis heart and mind. Something completely new, where God's truth was made alive in her heart and mind and became far more than words on a piece of paper. In this way, she was practicing. She was applying the scripture tangibly in her life. The disintegration of the toxic thought, emotion, and root took months. And during those months, while she was busy disintegrating the the toxic thoughts, she was also rebuilding the structure of her brain with healthy thoughts filled with God's truth. This offered her a new perspective. She learned to take her eyes off herself and put them on Christ instead. Isn't this the Easter message? Let's talk David, a firm and faithful believer in the one true God who spent his life seeking God. His heart was turned toward God. He was a gifted musician, a warrior, and a great leader. But one day he slipped spiritually, big time. His offense was against God and those made in God's image. It took him a good while to come to his senses as the prodigal, but thankfully he did. And as a, as a result of one of the comments of one of his dearest friends, and ultimately, David's heart was fully restored. What did David choose to think about instead of his crimes? Well, he dwelled on the promises of God and the restoration in store for him. In other words, this is the story, Psalm 51, of a man who presses forward despite the shame, disgrace, and horrific nature of his sins, which he learned to acknowledge and hate. And with this humble and broken heart, David finds immeasurable relief, forgiveness, and restoration. And as believers, we can all relate. Christ's death and resurrection set the stage for the atonement of our sins and all the shame that might go with it and for reconciliation with God. We're no longer divided and distanced from God, but we're restored. We're set free. Our debt is paid in divine measure. All of this opens a path toward forgiveness, restored joy, and peace with God. You know, David lived centuries before Jesus. He penned Psalm 51 about a year, I believe, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba and after he had her husband Uriah murdered during war as Uriah was fighting on behalf of Israel. Indeed, King David's actions scandalized the nation of Israel and brought low the human being David, who was known as a man after God's own heart. This remarkable man, David, made some decision in in his life that were way off base, sinful, harmful to others, and a disgrace to the God he served and the nation he represented. Once his friend Nathan brought the truth directly to David's heart and mind, David did not stay stuck in his shame and regret. But I do think it may have taken considerable work on David's part to continue to walk in freedom and in God's love after that point. I wonder if some folks scorned his renewed state with God or even reminded him of his crimes. Perhaps they whispered about King David saying something like, and he calls himself God's anointed. What a failure. What a joke. No doubt David learned to remind himself of God's goodness and character time and time again. He continued to write psalms for God. He continued to minister to others out of joy. He was forgiven. And and so, so much that this only magnified his ability to love his master even more. 
As I read this psalm, don't just think of King David. Think of so many of the other biblical giants who persevered through their shame and regret. And think of Jesus, son of this very David we're talking about, who dealt directly with our shame. He bore it. Why would we want to pick it back up or stick it away in a closet? What benefit is it to us or those we love to do our life on earth under the shadow of shame? You know, we don't focus on the empty tomb at Easter, but we focus on the resurrected Christ. We fill our hearts and minds with God's truths and let that lead us into a place where we sing and praise God and where we can win others over to Him. Isn't that the idea? You know, others like our family members, others like the clerk at Croker, others like the woman who had an abortion or the man in prison for money laundering or embezzlement. Okay, let's listen to the words of this song. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me no wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices in burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the message from Galatians 2.20 that says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. End quote. Father, help us to know and apply this spiritual truth to our practical lives, that the tomb is empty. Although we cannot undo the wrongs we committed willfully or unknowingly, we can walk in the freedom your love offers us. May our hearts be positively melted by recognizing just how much you love us. We can joyfully sing about you and praise you. We can offer you our broken hearts where your love eclipses all shame and steers us in a new direction of hope and freedom. Give us a steadfast and willing spirit to do the work you have on earth for us to do. We are not turning back. Thank you for your sacrifice so that we may live. May you and you alone be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for tuning in. I'll catch you same time, same place next week. Dios primero y que Dios te bendiga. Chao.